Okay. Kelly starts night F3. As we said before, computer analysis over the last 35 years has shown this to be the best opening move for white. Used to be thought that E4 or D4 or even C4, but Bobby Fischer used to expound E4 saying best by test, and he was right before the computer age. But like our esteemed colleague sitting over there, he knew that knight F3 was the best move for white inherently because he started playing it over 20 years ago, all right? Yes, because they have really found that this is the best opening move for white. I think logically, if you think about it, it's because you've cleared out one of the pieces getting ready to castle. You only have one more piece to get out and then you can castle. So it's probably the reason for it. Plus, I mean, there's nothing wrong with controlling two center squares immediately. You know, immediately, because remember the fight for chess is for the four center squares for 95% of the game. So he who owns and controls these four center squares will have a much easier time than his opponent. So immediately you're staking your claim to d4 and e5. So Devo said if it's good enough for white, it's certainly good enough for black. Knight f6, countering the control of these two squares with control of d5 and e4, plus clearance so that you can get castled a lot faster. c4. What's the idea behind this for white? Well, if black is challenging d5, white automatically saying, look, I can't let you have total control of d5. I'm going to fight you for this. Besides, now I'm probably ready to get my knight to c3, and I'll fight you for those two center squares also. So black counters with c6. Looks like a Karo Khan opening, which is normally e4, c6. But I think the next move for black is going to be d5. And I think they're going to be challenging for the d5 square for a long time to come. Okay. White plays b3. A little unorthodox opening. The Larsen opening didn't start till the 70s. Bent Larsen, the Danish grandmaster, pioneered b3 as the first opening move for white and then bishop b7 to control the long diagonal. And there's nothing wrong with it because the hypermodern players like to control the center from far away. So a bishop sitting here at b2 does control d4 and e5. So he's sort of got a very pretty, what do we call this, guys? A pawn chain. chain. Very pretty little pawn chain on the white squares. Okay. So black has to find a counter. And sure enough, He's saying that if bishop goes to b2, my bishop will go to g7, okay? And we'll fight for that long diagonal. And sure enough, bishop b2 and bishop g7. So the fight is for the dark squares along this long diagonal, all right? White shoots g3 with the idea of probably Fianchetto the bishop here at g2, and you're gonna have two bishops raking the center from long away. Bishops are like artillery. You wanna shoot the shell a long way away. Um, bishops and rooks are like uh, long range pieces. Knights and queens are in your face pieces like hand grenades. Think of knights and queens like hand grenades, and these are like artillery pieces, okay? Best from long away. Sure enough, black says, Boom. I have castled. And like I said, till 35 years ago, we didn't have computers analyzing chess games. How many moves safer is this king than this king, guys? Four. four. This king is four moves safer than this king. That's what castling does. According to computer analysis, a castled king is four moves safer. That doesn't mean it's impregnable. You could still break this cubby hole open, but it's going to take you an extra four moves to do it, as opposed to having a king stuck in the center, which is why when you study grandmaster games, invariably when one side castles, the other castles almost immediately or very soon after to get those four moves of safety back. Okay. Bishop g2. So white's getting ready to do his little castle. And finally, black says, since I've castled and you haven't, my job is to crack the center wide open and try to come down here and checkmate the king. Okay. And white says, OK, you're going to do it, but it's going to take you an extra four moves to do it. I got my four moves back. Okay. So I'm just as safe as your king. 
Black comes up with a very interesting move. Knight a6, I think for one move, now you know the normal rule of thumb is that knights on the rim are dim, dim or grim. Either adjective use is fine, okay? It doesn't really matter. D3, I think what he's probably going to do is maybe C7 with the idea of E6 after pushing. That's probably what he's going to do, okay? Uh, bishop out. Is that right? Yeah, bishop out, bishop e6. And the last piece developed for white, last minor piece, queen d2. So you have all four minors developed. You have castled, and your queen and rooks are connected by the ninth move. This is beautiful chess. This is classic chess. Every one of your minor pieces are developed off the back rank. Your queen and rooks are connected, and your king is castled by the ninth move. This is how chess should be played. Okay. Queen to c8. What do you think the idea behind that move is, guys? The idea is that this bishop wants to come here to h3 and trade off this force trade this bishop. Simply like, if you know the King's Indian setup, White's objective is to trade this bishop at g7 with coming down to h6 with the queen and bishop lined up in the dark squares. And Black has the same idea, because basically, while it looks like this bishop is really ineffective because of this pawn chain on the white squares, in four or five moves, these pawns could be gone. And this diagonal is going to be raked by this star piece of white. So black is are saying, hey, if I can get rid of this piece around white's king, 10, 12 moves later, it'll be a lot easier. There won't be as much defense. All right? Rook e1. I think the thrust of e4 is in the air. Bishop h6. I don't think he'd give up a bishop for a knight at this point. Everybody know that bishops and knights in the opening sequence are pretty much equal at three points. Computer analysis sometimes has a bishop at 3.2 in the opening. But as the game goes on, these go up to four points. Bishops in endgame are worth four points. Knights stay at three, which is why if you study grandmaster games consistently, you will see that they love to trade their knights for your bishops. Try to hold on to your bishops as long as possible, because they are worth that extra point in endgame. And because white doesn't want this bishop traded, he just retreats and saying, hey, if you want to come here, you can attack air. There'll be nothing here for you to attack. Oh, I see. Wait a minute. This. This was not the move here, guys. I'm sorry. It was this move, and then he went here. That's what happened. He did want to trade, and he went here. I'm reading English notation. It's not algebraic, so I have to ex extrapolate it, and it doesn't quite work all the time. Black is trying to crack open White's cubby hole. White is trying to x-ray Black's queen through these two pawns. See how fast? This is a pin through two pawns, and Black felt it. He immediately moved his queen off the pin. That's what GMs do. They don't let a pin even take place. They get rid of the possibility of a pin before it even happens. They do it all the time. And if you study GM games, pins, pins, pins is the tactic they use the most. They love pins better than discoveries, better than forks, better than skewers, better than anything else. They love pins. Why is that, Ruben? Why do masters love pins more than anything else? Because they're easy. I don't know. They're easy to make, I guess. Okay, uh, a3 to keep the knight from jumping in. Now bishop h6, and 
starting his queen side expansion. He's going to try to crack through on the queen side. All right. Oh, okay. Knight to king knight five. Knight coming in. Let's take a look at this. Sacrifice here? No. Sacrifice here? Maybe. Okay. White takes pawn. Black takes pawn. We're almost at the uh, juncture. Attack the knight. The knight goes back to where it was, blocking off the rooks from connection. Rook up, pinning this pawn so it can't push because it's pinned on the queen. Are we attacking this pawn? Not really, because it's protected by the queen. But I think he created a pin on the queen. OK. He's also got it. Well. This is very. This is a very interesting move now. Knight here. Now, what happens if the pawn takes the knight? Bishop takes check. Oh, it would be mate, wouldn't it? It would be checkmate. How cute is that? Take my knight, and I will mate you. <laughs> I like that. But what about the knight if we? Well, here if he takes. Bishop takes checkmate. There's nothing to block. You can't block, and the bishop is controlling the escape squares. So you're attacking the queen, so the queen has to move, which she does. Knight comes out to attack the rook and gets developed. Rook goes down to take the seventh rank. Now, this knight is protected by the queen, but he is threatening to take a pawn at b7. Let's see, e5, possibly pushing here and then pushing again, getting rid of the protector around the king. Queen b3, lining up with the rook. What are we doing here? Let's take a look. Oh, a battery. Checkmate here. As soon as this pawn pushes, Queen says checkmate. That's why he prevented the pawn from being pushed. That's it. Okay. So black attacks the queen. And now mate. Here's what here's what White announced right now. Mate in seven. White announced mate in seven at this point. That's why I said this is the twenty first move. This is pretty wild. Okay. Knight takes pawn. Okay. What happens if pawn takes? I guess queen takes. You put two on this knight. This one's already protected by this. Okay, here we go. Here's the sequence. Uh, oh, bi a white, a black announced mate in seven at this point. Okay, here we go. Oh, black announced. Yeah. Check. King takes queen. Check. Where can this king go? Well, he can't go here because of this bishop. He can't go here or here, so he has two squares to go to. He can go here or here, f3 or g1. If he goes to g1, it's mate with the bishop. So he can't go to g1. He has to go to f3. He has no choice. Pawn, check. If the pawn takes, let's see. Yeah. Oh, this knight comes in, and I guess you get mated here. Yes, that would be mate, right? From here. If you take, it's mate here from this knight, because the king is totally trapped everywhere. So he can't do that, so he has to take with the king.
Check. Well, let's see. He can't go here or here because of the two knights. He can't go here because of the pawn. He can't go here or here because of the bishop. So he really has only, does he have one choice here, right? He has to go back. Check. Let's see where he can't go. Well, he can't go here, here, or here. He can't go here, and he can't go here, so this is his only square. Check. Let's see. He can't go here, and he can't go here. He can't go here or here. He has only one square. And he finally went back there, and the bishop got him. Wow. How many moves into the future can you see? Could you see 14 ply? No. no. Lucky well. if I can see one. <laughs> <laughs> that's a phenomenal game. That's, but that shows you how these GMs, and they all have photographic memories, all of them. I don't think there's one GM in the world that doesn't have a photographic memory which means that there's very little hope for us to become GMs. But we can become regular masters. Ruben did it. We can do it, right? Yes? Come on, you're up. You're up. You're up.